Okay. So it's uh, it's great for everyone to be here with us today on this webinar. We um, we are uh, we're delighted to have you here with us. We are going to be recording this session, as you know. the The hope of this webinar is to present and share the the um, the the scope of this text, and then also to make this recording available for our larger academic communities, uh, so that they can. Um, they can also uh, participate in this if they couldn't be here physically. So uh, my name is Paul Mihailidis, and I'm here with uh, co-editors Sangeeta Shresova and Megan Fromm and our host of contributors where we're really excited to be able to talk a little bit through uh, this, this, uh, this book that just, just got published called Transformative Media Pedagogies. Uh, and it's, it's really a labor of love that reflects on um, an experience uh, that the contributors here have been involved with some years uh, that takes place each summer in Salzburg, Austria, um, a program of the Salzburg Global Seminar, where uh, we've, we have been experimenting and engaging in uh, immersive uh, pedagogy, media pedagogies um, with global groups of students, practitioners, and other facilitators. So, uh, today we're joined by a host of our contributors, and what we'll do is introduce the book briefly and have some opening words and reflections, and then we'll take about five to six minutes with each section to talk through and highlight some of the contributing essays, and then we'll offer a closing se session. Uh, and panelists and participants, uh, we're glad to see so many people able to make it here, and we will, um, if there's any questions or comments or feedback, please put that in the question and answer and we'll be happy to engage with that along the way. Uh, so just quickly by a way of opening, this book um, was, again, as I mentioned before, it's really, it's, it's a chance for uh, a group of academics that are interested in the intersection of practice and, and scholarship and the intersection of application and teaching uh, who have been involved in a, in a global project called the Salzburg Academy on Media and Global Change uh, for, the last 10 to 15 years, depending on when the contributors came into the program, where we are um, where we are exploring the concept of individual and collective transformation as the underlying driver for dynamic learning experiences that support equitable and just civic futures. Uh, I write and share that um, because when we started in Salzburg, uh, the term transformation was probably the last thing that we that we used. We had a lot of other words that might describe what this project was, right? When you bring together groups of students from different cultures around the world along with faculty, put them in an environment that allows them to experiment and collaborate and be together. What, what do we consider a project like this? And over the years, we weren't too concerned with what we called it. We were very concerned with the process of what was happening and the process of of engagement, the process of learning, the process of challenging, um, so on and so forth. And so we, we use words like participatory, we use words like engaging, we use words radical sometimes. We had a whole bunch of ways that we would describe this. And when we stopped to put this text together, the word transformation kind of emerged as, as embodying what we do. And I'll read the definition of how we understand transformative pedagogies uh, that we, we write in the text that we say we define transformative pedagogies as the approach to pedagogical design that embodies shared presence with others, the pursuit of emancipatory and liberatory social change grounded in care for others, imaginative alternatives, and agentive action taking towards positive social change in the world. Um, that's a mouthful there, but when you buy this book, you'll get so hooked into it, you won't be able to put it down, I think. So, um, so the way that we decided to put this book together and what you'll hear now in a couple minutes is we, uh, Sangeeta and Meg and I uh, drafted the opening, um, the opening chapters where we talk a lot about the Salzburg Global Seminar and the setting and the place and the context for Salzburg. And then we identify what we consider the main values of transformative media pedagogies. And there's, a, there's three main values and, and Meg will take everyone through that later. Um, but they are care, imagination, and agency. And we, we realize that around those three constructs is where we could place most of the work and the, and, the, and the actions that were taking place in this program. 
And then lastly, uh, under each of those three constructs, we offer a series of essays written by contributors that are faculty uh, of the Salisbury Academy who share different approaches or different processes or different ideas and understandings of what takes place in Salzburg. And so um, we will, the, the text itself is full of those essays and they're short and they're uh, very, very powerful and, um, and they're very meaningful. And so today we'll hear a little bit about those in and of themselves, but um, you know, we wanted them to be critical and reflective writing, uh, and um, of course, grounded in, in the Salisbury Academy on Media and Global Change. And the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Sangeeta is, uh, while, this, while we, we, we focus on pedagogies that are about skills and competencies, um, this book is not only about what skills are in, involved in transformative media pedagogies, but we're looking at the processes and the pathways that um, that we can that we can connect to kind of helping support future storytellers and media makers um, in the world who are interested in 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 taking positive change or taking actions towards positive change. Uh, and so I wanted to just thank everybody for being here and for contributing to this book and for all the work that's taken place in Salzburg over the years. Uh, we will be back this summer, uh, which is wonderful news. And um, and I'm going to stop sharing now, and I'm going to turn it over to Sangeeta, uh, who's going to talk with Henry Jenkins a little bit around the context for the text. Thanks, Paul. It's, it's I'm just still overwhelmed by seeing everybody here, so it's really great. Um, so Henry, we're going to ask you to help us get started. Uh, you're somebody who wrote you wrote the foreword to the book. You visited Salzburg, um, I think, at least once, and you've heard me talk about it endlessly. So I'm really curious to, th to think about, uh, to hear what you think about when, um, when you hear, when you think about the transformative media pedagogies and what they may offer to related fields that you work in. I'm thinking here specifically of media literacy, connected learning, civic engagement, even the civic imagination that we work on together. Um, so maybe we can start there and then I'm going to ask you for some practical tips that you would have for people who may be wanting to apply this work. Sure. Well, I, I went in the summer of 2016, as I write in the introduction, my, I, on the road there, I stopped in London and was in London the night the Brexit vote came down. And during the night, there was this, this lightning hitting the courtyard, loud, loud things. And we woke up this morning, the following morning, and the city was flooded, literally flooded. Uh, as if God was taking his wrath out on the Brits for that vote. I remember sitting in the hotel room watching, our, and the Schlaus watching uh, the, elect, the, camp, the conventions, the Democratic and Republican conventions. There were news constantly of terrorism attacks. Uh, you know, there had been some sort of incident in Austria while we were there, and we were having to restrict students travel. So there was a sense of darkness in the midst of which were these students who were incredibly upbeat and engaged. And the relationship that I saw emerge between students and faculty was really profound. So one thing that I got from it was that if you're going to do connected learning, you actually have to connect. And the range of activities here described in the book really conveys a sense of connection the range, different ways of interfacing between faculty and students, different from going on field trips to having talent shows and live performances to both formal lectures, workshops, smaller seminar discussions, all incorporated into the mix. And I think what came out of that was a powerful connection. You know, it's hard to separate what happens in Salzburg from Salzburg itself and the history of that location uh, and the history of the original Salzburg Academy and young people coming together after the end of World War II to talk about American culture as a kind of intervention. Uh, and I, having dug through Margaret Mead's papers, uh, I was struck by this quote, and she has lots of materials there about those first workshops, but I was struck by the material, this says, the words France and Norway or Czechoslovakia were no more, no more pro produced as the first association in our minds, a piece of the map and some vague prejudices, but very concrete pictures 
of some friendly faces, acts of courtesy and help, witty remarks, or memories of outstanding personal destinies. And that seems like very much what I experienced there as well. These young people came together. They didn't know each other. They were from different countries. Some of them were countries, you know, with long histories of antagonism, and they found a way of relating to each other. And it was because every step of this pedagogy was so well planned out with those kind of goals of bringing about connection and empathy, with the goals of embodying these ideas and practice, with the idea of the civic imagination. So much goes on to this. And I think the book does a really amazing job of unpacking that. Thank you for that. So if you were to, you know, as you say, one of the challenges of this is that this pedagogy grew out of a specific instance and out of a specific location. And what we are trying to do now and what this book seeks to do is to make this transferable to other places. So I guess if there were any final thoughts you had about for somebody sure. who's going to want to apply this, that would be really helpful. Well, I think, first of all, I would try to understand whatever the location I'm at, as well as the team at Salzburg Academy have come to understand their location, right? This is not simply a, a model, a curriculum you transport from place to place. It's a philosophy of learning that has to be embedded in the lives of the students in relation to the location they're at. So start by analyzing the location and the students and where they're coming from. Know your students well, mm -hmm. then seek the activities they're going to achieve the goals described here. And there's some activities in the book that I think can be applied to any context. Uh, the Schumann Library, for example, is one that I remember very vividly and I think is a great example of something that uh, takes advantage of whatever the students bring to the table in order to communicate to each other and open up doors of communication across difference. So that's what I would be looking for. But I think the principles here are principles that we need in media literacy movement. We need in connected learning. We need in our traditional academic disciplines. Uh, so I strongly support trying to figure out how to way to apply those principles in your own location with your own students. Thank you for that, Henry. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Meg. Thank you so much for that. I think it is uh, no accident that we'll start off our conversation today talking about the idea of care. We have three sections to our book, as Paul alluded to, and I'll share with you a concept map, and Paul's sharing it on the screen as well. There's a link in the chat to a PDF, if that's easier. Um, so this is sort of our concept map for this text and really thinking about these three values as foundational for any type of not just learning experience, but especially an experience that we wanted, which is to bring together people in the hope of, you know, better futures um, and better relationships. And so we'll start with care. And I'm really excited to bring together the folks who have written for this section. We've got um, Carol and Sangeeta and Roman, and I'm going to have them talk a little bit about the things that were important for them in their chapters. You can't connect, as Henry said, without care. And so I think this is a lovely place to start. So caring ethic is a foundational concept in this section. And Carol, who is one of the best educators I've ever met in my life, I'd like to start with you and talking about, you know, no pressure, Carol, but um, you're amazing and inspirational. And in your chapter, you wrote about how important informal spaces are to building strong relational bonds. And so I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about why that matters and what those informal spaces can look like. Well, thank you. And I'm super happy to be here. Um, and I echo everything that's been said so far. I do think that we need to start with, with care. Um, uh, so my essay focuses first on um, what I called a form of the invisible curriculum and the power of learning that can take place in informal settings outside of the regular um, 
classroom environment and the more formal course content and curriculum that's typically offered inside uh, or within that. So at the Salzburg Global Academy, but really anywhere, um, the connections formed in those moments of, of sharing between the students and the faculty over a sim something as simple as a cup of coffee or a walk around the lake can give rise to opportunities for both parties to learn about each other's cultural differences and varied perspectives on issues and so much more. Um, so through those conversations and shared activities in informal settings, it is natural that a stronger bond can form and then motivation for further learning can increase both in and out of the classroom because there's a sense that the individuals involved are now known to each other a little bit more. And people need to know that you care before they care what you know. And that's been, that's a phrase that has been kicked around a lot, but I, truly, truly believe it. Um, I think what can be, you know, really more powerful than to be seen and known and understood. So in the essay, I mentioned um, that I learned from a student from Africa um, at the Salzburg Global Academy that a greeting in the Zulu language is um, saubonia, and I may be pronouncing it incorrectly, um, but I think that's it. And it translates to mean, I see you. And the Zulu response is yebo saubonia. Um, and that means I am here and I see you too. So connections formed in informal settings go a long way towards seeing and really deepening our understandings of those that, um, with whom we work in educational settings, um, no matter where we are. So. Thank you, Carol. That is, I love that you really emphasize that idea of like knowing who is there and um, seeing who our students are and letting them see each other. And those are not ones that you can build into a formal curriculum. As you mentioned, those informal spaces are really where that happens. And I think part of what feels so radical about our book that shouldn't feel radical is to say that, to say that education needs time and space for that. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I want to, in some ways, contrast, you know, this idea of uh, knowing each other and place it next to Roman. Roman wrote two chapters in this section. Um, and one of them actually brings a lot of rigor to it. And rigor doesn't have to be antithetical to care. And so he um, writes in one of his sections about confronting assumptions that are related to identity and identity politics and how confronting those is a way to help students reach their full potential as change makers. And so Roman, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about how this approach, which is really intense, it's like a 90 minute you know, seminar that's full of like probing on the spot, really dynamic, rigorous, and at times kind of confrontational questions and you do it in a really structured collaborative way. So how does that represent this idea of care for you? Thank you, Megan. Hi, everyone. It's so lovely to see everyone. And just to echo that this is totally a labor of love. And I'm really proud to be part of this, driven of this book. Um, yeah, so, it's, you know, what, what does care mean? Care means that you, that you connect with somebody, that you care about them, right? That you understand them and that you have feelings for them. So, so to care for someone, you need to, you know, for the other, you need to emotionally connect with them. And that requires you to step outside of yourself to see them. I mean, what Carol said is beautiful. You know, you see them, you recognize them for what they really are. And the things we see in others are not always, you know, the things that are the way others want to be seen. And, and so one of the chapters, which is about a human library is about not judging people, you know, not judging the book by its color, but the session that you just referred to is about, um, you know, questioning our own assumptions and our own conceptions. And it is, it is a very rigorous, um, sessions and, and it's almost like sort of you know um, a scenario or role playing of me sort of you know pushing them and asking why you know you know why should we be equal you know why does it why should I care about you and it sounds really aggressive and like you know rude but um, uh, people don't think about why they held they hold the beliefs they do so you have to it's just an opportunity to sort of for them to question their preconceptions and beliefs and then to be able to listen to other people i mean some students you know most of our students want to change the world and they think that everybody else wants to do the same thing and when you have a room 
students from all around the world and everybody has their own priorities and their own beliefs, the differences emerge. So then it becomes about how can you coexist in space with people who have radically different viewpoints from you and then care becomes about coexisting with others and being able to like survive as a species i think so uh, it's in, in practical terms it means like you know asking questions and then being able to have the conversation and the connection and i think you know com communication and conversation you know free and open and respectful is key to is key to care because if you don't connect then you can't care thank you roman that that idea of I think not not only just coexisting, but connecting through those differences is a lot of what I think Sangeeta, your work seeks to do. And your chapter really explicitly frames these ideas of care by exploring place and embodied connections and how those can help develop students. So can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, these ideas, especially I think kinesthetic empathy, which is so interesting um, within this idea of care. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, I think we, when I first arrived at Salzburg years ago, I was so struck by how the students all moved together through the day, right? They, they're in routines, they move together. And then there are these moments where their embodiment is actually crucial. And I'm going to highlight two moments in the, in this, in the uh, academy that happen where that are back to back. Usually one is a talent show where the students perform their cultures and different and their skills. And, and it's a very boisterous, lively, people do planks, people perform traditional dances, people sing. And it's just a space where they celebrate each other and accept each other, no matter what the skill level. I believe Megan, you always play the flute and we have, a, I mean, we have performances by the faculty as well. So it's an equal equalizing moment where everybody performs. Um, and the next morning, everybody gets on a bus and goes to the Mount Housen concentration camp. And, and, and those two things just happen usually back to back. Uh, and, they're, and, the, and I think it's really important that the students not only understand each other in terms of what they say, but they also understand each other in terms of what they experience. And the talent show, because it's so performative, sets them up to view each other's bodies in motion, to understand what they're, how they're experiencing things. And then they're moving through the space that is arguably traumatic for many different reasons. Uh, for some of them, controversies around the Holocaust, for some of them, personal connections to the Holocaust, for many, the first experience ever with the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I feel like this, just them moving together in this way helps them get past the words. <laughs> it helps them get past words that they may or may not have to articulate what they're experiencing. Right, that idea of that, just that shared experience, you don't have to have a common language because you build it by being there together, which I think is so cool. Thank you. And I know um, we're gonna transition into the next section, which is about imagination. And Sangeeta is gonna facilitate that one for us. I'm just gonna keep talking. Yes, thank yes. you, Mike. <laughs> so in the imagination section, we have a cluster of articles that all engage with how we think beyond the current moment, how we think beyond our current constraints. I don't see the screen, Paul, I see a black screen for some reason, so I don't know if that's important. Um, and we also think about, to, uh, to quote Pablo Freire here, as hopelessness as a form of silence. And, in, and I'm paraphrasing him here, an imagination as a necessity for thinking about, um, I think Roman said, making the world a better place. <laughs> so the imagination is a really key ingredient here. So I'm actually going to just ask each of the contributors following the same format that we set up to talk a little bit about their articles um, that they that they added here. So Eric, I'm going to start with you. Um, you had you had this provocative term, palace of the mind. The Schloss is a palace, a physical palace, and you pushed us to think about how we break out of that and think about palaces of the mind. Can you talk a little bit about, about this and how this approach may uh, provide us with imaginative dimensions to the transformative media pedagogies? Yeah, thanks, Sangeeta. Uh, great to be here and happy to talk about this. Um, it, some of these ideas have already been brought up in what Henry has said and, and others really, which is how should we be thinking about the how should we be thinking about the place, the location of this uh, of, of this experience? And I've been coming now for, I don't know, over eight years, I suppose. And the whole time, uh, every year that I go to Salzburg, I, I really I'm, I wonder to, to what extent is the power of this experience, the fact that we are in a beautiful palace, uh, in a beautiful place overlooking beautiful mountains uh, where Sound of Music was filmed. Uh, and so to what extent is it that? 
And then to what extent is it the co-presence, um, the, the, the collaboration, the delight that, that, that exists within it? And the answer is it's, it's both, right? But the, but the way that I've, I've been sort of framing this problem in my own mind is, yes, we're in a palace, but what does it look like to, to actually have this, to, to export this palace, this palace of the mind? What does it look like if we, we actually export that idea into other, uh, other learning experiences? So, um, you know, so what's the, how do we think about the power of learning in here? And, and so I use the idea of play as a way of, a, a way of thinking about this, right? So one way of thinking about play is that it's freedom within constraints. All play is constrained. Um, and, and we operate within these constraints and we have this kind of freedom and this ability to, to create and to explore and to, and to delight and to fail safely and all those things that we value in, in play. And, and ultimately, the, so then the design challenge then becomes how can we build structure for learning that enables play? What does that even look like? When we think about the classroom, it's not that, right? Where we, we create structures, we create cages, we don't create sandboxes. We, you know, we create, uh, you know, we, we create constraints, but we don't allow for freedom. So in Salzburg, we're actually creating constraints, but we're, we're encouraging and, and front loading the freedom. You know, put another way, it, it's, it seems to me that Salzburg is connecting all the best parts of summer camp uh, with the best parts of learning, right? We're, we're front loading play um, in, in, the, in, in learning, um, and we're, and, and which is what happens in summer camp. And if you watch kids in, in sleepover camp, right? That's exactly what happens, right? They all travel together, they all, they all move, they all delight together, they play games together, um, you know, they share in, 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 in movements and, and play. And then, and then that, that experience Lasts, lasts, you know, for a long time, just like what we've created in Salzburg, but we've done it in the context of higher education. That's what's brilliant. And so I keep thinking about, and I encourage us all to think about, what is this palace of the mind? How do we move this outside of a palace in Austria and put this into our everyday learning experiences? Yeah, thank you for that, Eric. Um, so Karen, I'm, I don't have a really smooth transition because I have to get through these. <laughs> um, I, also, I was trying to think of a connection, but I'm just going to go for it. You bring a different perspective. I mean, the, you, you know, on one hand, we have play, you bring journalism. So this idea of journalism, and yet you talk about immersive storytelling as an entry point into the imagination as well, um, as a way into thinking into as a way into thinking about others and thinking about how we approach the stories we tell about them and with them. Can you share a little bit about that? Please? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to see you. Um, yes, as you say, I, my, I, where I'm coming from, we've all talked about where we come from is as a journalist and journalism educator. So rather than thinking about immersive storytelling, which often we think about gives us the sense of sort of really being there and is often associated with VR, for example, and technological um, approaches to storytelling. I'm really talking about an immersive approach that keeps us close, as Sangeeta and others have mentioned, to the voices of those whose stories we as journalists are re retelling. Um, and so it, the idea is it, that, that we work within, within workshops at Salzburg within a sort of a sense of having a shared experience as story listener, as I would call, the, the, those who are listening to the stories of others and storyteller, those, those who are telling those stories, the story listeners then thinking about how they retell them. And we, um, the students don't know each other terribly well uh, by the time that I've, I've been running my workshop. So that it's been interesting for them to think, first of all, about interrogating their sense of self, a little as Roman has touched on, thinking about identity construction, where are they coming from? And then thinking as well about context as Henry has mentioned, we've often been working in quite difficult contexts over the last few years. If we had met during the pandemic, clearly that would have produced the most incredible context for, for us to be working within, to think about the importance of socio-political and cultural contexts. And then to encourage them to, in this sort of series of dialogues that they're having, to interrogate their own assumptions and the values, the normative values of their practice, the skills that they have perhaps learned to date, whether they're journalists or media makers coming from other disciplines, and thinking about how perhaps they could reimagine those um, in order to um, engage with and connect with the people that they, whose stories they are listening to and retelling, and the responsibility that they bear in doing that is also really, really important. Um, and thinking then about how we might restore, reimagine our practice as what is an essentially human activity, where journalists are not seen just as those who are telling the stories of others, 
but understood as well to be human beings, people like any other. And then I guess the powerful theme that emerges is that word that we've already touched on here, empathy. We talk about emotional literacy and then thinking about storytelling as perhaps not being all knowing, which is a top down idea, but how this immersive approach where they have really listened actively to each other and thought very much about the context within which they are engaging with people and connecting with them, how that flattens hierarchies through that process of acting lis active listening so that they can speak nearby, not about. And I think there's real power in that for us to connect better and then to imagine together as well. Thank you for that, Karen. So we've been talking a lot about the present and um, of course the students are also thinking about the future and their future and the futures of our, our world. And Pablo, you bring the memory and you bring the past and you bring thinking about the past as memory as inspiration for our ima active imaginations. Can you share a little bit about why you think that's important and what it brings to our, our pedagogical approach? Sure, Sanjita. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. I'm really happy to share this uh, short space with you. Um, I think that there is a common understanding that when we talk about history, we are centering or fo focusing on the past, right? Or at least when we are young, we are um, we are taught history in a, in a way that history is always something that has passed and that is closed. So I think one of the powers of art is going back into these episodes or these uh, records of history and bringing them to the present in order to project ourselves into the future. I think a place as Salzburg kind of uh, confirms how memory is an embedded quality, like an embodied also, you know, like we, uh, we inhabit memory and we activate memory every single day. And being in a place so charged with history kind of confronts us with both the dark and the bright sides of history and how we are responsible of what we do with that history. So Salzburg and especially that palace having this dark history of um, the Archbishop and, and of course the Nazis, but at the same time, this very bright history of the Salzburg a festival. So I think it is a great place to activate this relationship. And in, in those terms, the article, I try to draw uh, on two concepts that is like uh, tradition. So tradition in art is also very important. Like we always are working with traditions and what's been done in our disciplines. But at the same time, while working with tradition, we are trying to innovate and put our glance forward, right, and our, our own perspective on the world. So I think art as a way of dealing with memory is a strong uh, front to, to explore the horizons of possibility. And this has a lot to do with what Freire says about um, hopelessness being a paralyzing force, because uh, I, uh, at the same time, for example, painter Gerard Richter, this German painter, says that art is the highest form of hope because precisely it works with models of the world. So when we try to reshape the world through works of art, we are making it possible to imagine other words to live in and share together. So I think that going back to memory is a way to projecting ourselves into the future at the same time. Thank you for that, Pablo. And with the projection, I'm going to actually turn it over to Paul, who's going to take us through agency. Thanks, Sangita. And thank you, everybody, for these contributions. I know this is um, this is just a, it's like a quick, quick, quick taste of these chapters, uh, these essays. And, um, and then we will be, um, after agency, we'll be hearing from one of the founders of this project who can provide us hopefully with some strong reflections. Um, so I'm here with uh, the agency, some of our contributors to this concept of agency. And so I think as we, as we put this text together, we thought really about these ideas, these concepts being overlapping in a sense, but also kind of that, that taking from the Hannah Arendt kind of how do we, how do we understand, um, how do people become begin to feel empowered to reveal themselves to others through their acts in the world. And what, what does that mean? Um, what does that concept of agency mean? And so in this book, we put together a series of essays um, towards agency that talks a little bit about the ways in which we 
think about um, you know that self and collective efficacy needed to have social impact. And so I'll start with Chris and your chapter is about, uh, your chapter is on collaborative curation and radical persistence. And so um, you talk about this immersive activity around the music collaborative music curation as an act of radical persistence. So I'd love if you could talk about that term a little bit and how you think that this, this kind of experience you describe as a pedagogy supports radical persistence. Absolutely. And, and again, I'm ha happy to be here with y'all. Happy to see everybody's faces. So you guys are giving me life this morning uh, on the West Coast. Uh, so we understand the, the, the term radical persistence, uh, which came out of conversations um, between uh, uh, Paul and I and another one of our colleagues, uh, Moses Shumo, as uh, the sustained uh, long-term activism that resists systemic inequality inequality and uh, presses for social economic justice, right? And what we were finding was with you know, our attention to care at Salzburg, with our attention to imagining together that we would have these profound experiences, both as faculty and as the students would have these profound experiences and they would leave uh, the Salzburg uh, Media Academy like on fire to push for justice, right? They, they were ready to get out into the world and, and make their change. and. We, we started to, to, to wonder, uh, but when we're thinking about the persistence compact, uh, concept in terms of the long-term and sustained approach to this, how can we assist them um, in, in maintaining that momentum, right? Like when they get out into the world, they're on fire, they're pushing, but we as uh, more senior scholars, more senior activists um, understand that there's gonna be these these disappointments understand that it's a it's a heavy lift that it's a long road and we we're Paul and I were having a conversation one day talking about like what can we provide for the students that they can take with them right what could we um, come up with that could be a, a sort of like a keepsake that they could take with them that would help them continue um, to sustain that on fire mentality right um, and so as we were talking uh, for me, as a, as an Africana scholar at heart, I always reach back to the, the Black radical tradition. To for most of my ideas, that's that's what I pull from to be generative, and the concept of music played such an important role in uh, sustaining and affirming um, life of African Americans, you know, throughout um, American history, Long Night of Slavery, Jim Crow, and so we we looked at music as something that could be um, extremely powerful for the students to take with them, but also something that could be doable within the, the, the parameters of the Media Academy in terms of the three weeks that people had together. And so we we kind of formulated this, this exercise that would allow students to draw upon music to reflect on their own individual identities. And then through collectively putting together this playlist would allow them to have these kind of inner intersubjective exchanges or intersubjective conversations that would lead to more understanding. We could kind of package it into music, they could take it with them and they could draw upon the music to reactivate those memories of doing life together uh, at Salzburg to, to help them hopefully uh, be able to stay in the game for longer, right? When they're experiencing that the concept of burnout or experiencing the concept of loneliness, they could draw from the playlist that they had created together and it would reactivate those memories of uh, which inspired them and, and then kind of allow them to tap into that transformative experience again from a distance. So I guess that, that was the best what we tried to do with that. Thanks, Chris. Um, and we still do, we should share those. We still do have those experimental playlists, of course. Um, really appreciate that. So Claudia, I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll come to you next. And you, your chapter titled Research as Power, your essay titled Research as Power, um, you make the case for research enabling more engaged and active media makers and storytellers. And I'd love for you just to share a little bit about uh, how you understand the role of research uh, in, this, in, the, in the Salzburg space and, and around this concept of transformative media pedagogies. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, research, scientific research is usually confined to the walls of academia, and we rarely see it in our everyday lives. I see research as power, 
primarily because it can be used to solve real societal problems. Why this matters in relation to the academy and to media is this intense and growing relationship between, um, between media and audiences. So regardless of what we do, we consume and produce media on a daily basis. And by media, we don't anymore mean legacy traditional media like newspapers and TV. The media we talk about nowadays, the media are us and what we communicate with others. In the academy in specific, faculty highlight the valuable role scientific research plays in fostering civic agency. We do this by removing the barriers that accompany research, and we do this by focusing on the real value of research which beyond academia, it means nurturing a scientific mindset in the students. Once students grasp the power of scientific research holds in providing real answers to real problems, they can use this power to engage with media in a more responsible and a more proactive manner, and consequently witness the transformations they can themselves bring about in their societies. Um, the faculty approach to research is rooted in critical thinking and metacognition and these types of um, uh, approaches. Uh, these together raise students' awareness of their own thought processes and by doing so allow them to monitor their thinking and their learning. So the more engulfed students become in this type of learning environment, the more they will appreciate the power of research in bringing about change in their societies. So um, just to recap, research is really a tool of empowerment. Once they understand what it means, they can do so much with it. Thanks, Claudia. And I, I couldn't agree more the way that, you know, the, what, what the assumptions when they come into a program like this of research um, are often kind of something that's not what not it's, it's almost an antithesis to the actions that they hope and want to take in the world. But I think your, your essay does such a good job about connecting that the idea of research and power to act as, as almost one and the same. So, uh, and then, and then um, Steve, we're going to end, we're going to end this agency session before we move to the closing um, with your chapter, which you, you title the evolving educator, uh, which is um, an, an essay title that that is dear to my heart. And I'd love you to kind of talk a little bit about um, a little bit about how you understood the, you know, you talk about immersive pedagogical communities and the larger implications of the Salzburg Media Academy experience on how you've approached your own your own evolution as a as an educator. And I'd love if you could just share a few reflections on um, how this experience has, has impacted you and your thoughts on pedagogy uh, in general. Sure, thank you, Paul. Actually, I think the um, title was something the editors suggested to me and I was very honored that they perceived me to be still evolving <laughs> after all these years, and at least since 2008 when I started with the program. But um, I remember coming there and I think it's been emphasized that it's, it's a, the entire structure needs to be taken into account sort of a macro curriculum. And so those of us new to such a thing might have thought, well, this will never work. You know, how can you possibly bring this many different kinds of students from all over the world and do anything that's uh, coherent and meaningful? So I think compared, you have to let go of that, you know, as, as an evolving educator. And I think compared to more familiar classroom work, um, it's more holistic, um, kind of have to let go of delivering the content. These things have been mentioned before other settings, but, uh, and being more explicit about normative values, like we mentioned equity and uh, participatory and civic. And uh, these are not things that educators have necessarily been comfortable doing. Try to be, a, you know, straight down the middle and not reveal your, your inner values and biases. But, you know, I think that's, will foreground those. So I've done more with that, I think, in my news literacy teaching is to foreground the explicit civic values that I bring to the topic. Um, students will assume you have values. They just think you may be hiding them from them if you're not uh, careful about it. So I think um, the thing that we value so much uh, that's difficult to transport is that it's a community of educators in real time, interdisciplinary, cross-national, how rare is that to have? So pedagogy becomes not just a private problem that we all face you know, in our inner life, trying to compose the syllabus together, but it's a shared challenge, including, for example, the teaching of the uh, median genocide that, that uh, 
discussion of the Holocaust, which we tweaked over many years to see, you know, how is it these students are responding to this in such an emotional, deep way? And how can we best approach it in an honest way with still being helping them to, to confront these issues? So <clears throat> that was a, a challenge. I think applying this to my own teaching back here at the University of Texas, I, I, I'd done a little bit of it before, but I probably really appreciate the emphasis on a case method or pulling out a theme like immigration and populism and wrestling with that, not just presenting media literacy tools sort of in isolation, but uh, thinking about a theme which would benefit from the application of some of these um, media literacy tools. So they're not, uh, media literacy is not a set of tools in and of itself. <clears throat> I like and appreciate and have adopted the use of more public facing platforms like uh, we did with Medium. And I've imported that right back to my classroom where uh, students can put their work up and just, you know, emphasize that this is something to be consumed outside of the classroom. Uh, so in my classes like Understanding 9-11 or News Literacy, I've set up Medium platforms for all of those. Thinking about timelines of following a story over time have been very valuable. Uh, so those are uh, particular things. I think just in um, terms of the um, care issue, I, I do feel like, you know, something needs to be said that we care for each other as faculty. And we, you know, it's an unusual experience in a way to, to care that much about what other peers think about our teaching because it's usually private. And, and yet we want to be, do a good job. We don't want to let each other down. And maybe we could put something more of that back into our home community, institutional communities. And I think just with uh, in recent um, last couple of years, we've um, observed how the pandemic has focused our attention on what's been lost. What are we missing so much? And this really highlights some of these principles that we've been talking about. Uh, I've, I've composed a um, a, a essay on, on Medium that I published uh, the summer when we first had to miss uh, weren't able to hold the, the uh, program and just thinking about, okay, what is it that this community, this approach helps us to do? It provides a certain resilience in the face of so much loss of what we're accustomed to and to, to know that uh, we have a community to draw on, to um, rely upon. And it's, a, it's been a loss. You know, we've lost a faculty member, which was profound loss in Moses Shumo. But we've also had ambiguous loss that I talk about. You know, what is, I don't even know what I've lost, but having a community that's ongoing, that cares, that's involved in common um, enterprise has helped. It's helped me. I, I think it's helped my colleagues. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. That that um, thank you. That the very uh, very kind comments and and profound and um, much appreciated. So, and Chris and Claudia as well as we transition um, here from agency just to uh, our closing session. And just wanted to thank everyone again for being with us and inviting uh, inviting the president and CEO of the Salzburg Global Seminar, Stephen Salier. To, um, who's also a co-founder along with Susan Moeller, his wife, who's not able to join us um, because of prior academic commitments. But um, Stephen, as, as the founder of this program, um, you know, and now listening to this, I'm struck by what Henry called, you know, that it's not necessarily that we've created a set of products or outcomes, but a philosophy of learning. Uh, and, and I think that a text like this is, trying as best it can to struggle with those moments and those ideas and and um, and those instances that make this so powerful. And one of the big you know questions we've always had in putting this book together was, can you really articulate what happens in Salzburg to a wider community? Is that possible? And that's something that we struggle with as we wrote. So um, I thought it'd be you know wonderful if, as you kind of think back on the initial intentions of creating a project like this to seeing how far it's come if you could offer a, a few words of reflection on on the imprint that that you believe this media academy has had on the world oh, and you just have to unmute yourself sorry Stephen. 
Okay, sorry. To find the unmute button. Here we go. Um, well, hello, everyone. And the real stars of the Academy have been talking uh, up to this point. And I want to begin by congratulating all of you on not only a fine book, but uh, all the work that has led up to it uh, in your scholarship and teaching, as well as in your participation in the Salzburg Academy. Um, as Paul uh, said, we started this project 15 years ago. It seems like yesterday, and it seems like an eternity um, in, in the way that so much has changed. Um, when we began, um, we were in a universe of expanding free media. I know I looked at various indices and the world kept getting freer uh, in terms of expression. And today the map doesn't look quite the same. Um, technology was exploding. Social media was beginning in its infancy to proliferate. And we all felt incredibly optimistic about what that was going to produce in terms of many voices being heard that didn't have the opportunity to be heard in a more controlled media context. Um, the barriers to entry were falling for people to be heard and to present their ideas. Um, and there was a sense of trust in those early days in social media. We, we felt that you know, online communities could police themselves. Um, who would possibly engage in hateful or injurious speech if they were called out? And um, some of these ideas um, seem dated and old and, and perhaps even a little naive viewed 15 years uh, from that origin in 2007. But they still inform the way we think about the world and we think about media. And they very much informed then and now our view about what kind of media um, literacy, what kind of media education we all need um, as we have become not just consumers, but co-creators of media and producers of media. And that shift has really been profound over the period of the Media Academy. And we have been reacting and evolving in that context. Um, today, we look at a situation where the threats to free expression are multiplying, um, both in countries which we thought were the sort of homes of democracy, democratic traditions and in others that uh, appeared 15 years ago to be moving in a very different direction than they do today. We have examples of central tracking and control uh, being the products of the technology explosion, not just explosions of opportunities to say and be heard, say what you want and to be heard. Um, as others have said, we're emerging also from two years of sort of isolation, um, where I think we all are feeling the needs to connect um, both in person and using media. Salzburg Academy has been, as others have said better than I can, a unique place, a place of free inquiry. Um, the inspiration to rethink everything we thought we knew and everything we sort of took for granted and to realize we can't take anything for granted. We have to be um, co-creators of our, our, our future and hopefully take some of the inspiration that we have felt in the Salzburg Academy back into classrooms and institutions that we're a part of around the world. Um, what has been so special for me as someone who came from before Salzburg, 25 years of being a practitioner in media, in radio and television, um, has been this blend of academics, of practitioners, of cross-cultural thinkers that have not only been part of our faculty, but have been speakers and participants and mentors for our, our students. And I think the, the scholarship and the teaching that has emerged as a result of the academy, at least in the situations that I've been able to be a part of and to participate in, 
been profoundly different than, than they were 15 years ago. And I think that if I want to feel hopeful about the future, and I do feel hopeful about the future in spite of all of the uh, trends that sometimes lead you to near despair, um, it's because I think there are people like the people who wrote chapters for this book and who are on this call and who are in the classroom and, and inspiring a next generation of, of students and producers and thinkers, that's the source of that of that um, inspiration for me and that excitement. Um, as some of you know, I'm standing down in the summer as president of Salzburg Global Seminar. But when I look back on the what will be 17 years, I've been in this job probably far too long. But uh, this is one of the things I'm proudest of. Uh, and yeah, I'm proudest of the community that's formed. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of watching the evolution of the work and thinking of the people who make up the academy. And I'm excited when I hear from the students who are out doing amazing things all over the world and who still talk about their experience in Salzburg as being formative for them, uh, in some cases, transformational. Um, so I just want to end by saying I think there's a lot of meat in this in this book, there's and it's the culmination of a lot of experience and a lot of of thoughtful thinking and and sincere humility and contribution that all of you have made to this 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 field. So, thank you. Um, I hope those who have been listening will be inspired to want to pick this book up. Um, use it as a point of reflection and hopefully find some things that are useful to take back into your classrooms. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, and as we've come to the end of our of our uh, of our book launch, uh, just wanted to thank everyone on the screen for staying with us today. And uh, it really is such a a, a a wonderful community. Um, I'm struck by all the all the comments here, and particularly those that talk about it's not only the pedagogical experience that the students have. I think it's the experience that that the group of faculty have, and that I think without that, there's only so far you can think about transformation for the for students and other communities. So this group has um, has and will continue to do amazing work and um, hopefully this book can help share some of the ideas and some of the approaches we have to doing this work and uh, please follow up with us all and uh, wish you all a wonderful day. Thanks again for being with us everybody. <laughs>